Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. My name is Jackson Altesh, and today we're going to be taking the first bite of the elephant, which is power play. So power play is at its core the idea of galactic powers struggling and vying against each other for greater control of space. So kind of a common theme in everything life related. There's always somebody struggling against somebody else for power and control. Uh, this video is going to be one in a series of videos that discusses power play uh, from a high level down to a much lower level, uh, as well as pretty much gives it to you in bite-sized chunks because it is a very large, very complicated system. So let's get started with the overview. So if you sit in your cockpit to bring up the UI for it, go to your left panel, bottom left-hand corner down there, Galactic Powers, and select it. Bring up a three-frame window here. Because we're not pledged to anybody, the third frame on the right there is blank. We can take a look at all of the different powers by selecting the middle pane. So the powers, really each one of them is going to have something that you might happen to want. Uh, we'll show you how to get that in just a second here. But first, let's take a look at the basics of how power play works. So the underpinning unit that drives the backend economy, which is power play, is a little thing called Command Capital, or CC. This is gained from planets which are exploited um, and to a lesser extent planets which are controlled. So the important thing to know with this is that there's some income, there's some upkeep, there's some overhead, and then you have some remainder. The remainder is what becomes important. Now, there are also some other details over here on the right-hand side. Uh, in terms of the expansion and control phases, you can take a look at what each respective faction is strong or weak against. Uh, really, if you just get into it, it's something to look at, but it's not necessarily something to spend all of your time scheming and dreaming around. So the next tab we have over here discusses the benefits of pledging towards any given power. So the ratings within the powers extend from 1 through 5. For each one of these, you get a number of preparation nominations, which allow you to assist in nominating a system for takeover or for being placed into expansion, expansion status. You also end up getting yourself uh, some of the power commodities. Those are allocated every half hour and are generally used for doing things such as fortifying or uh, preparing systems. Basically, the, basically, in the case of Aisling Duvall, I believe those are propaganda. So you buy them by the ton, you haul them to where they need to go, and you drop them off and you get merits as a result of them. So we can see here at rate, rating 3, you get 50 of them. Uh, 50, excuse me, 50 prep nominations, you get 20 power commodities per every half hour. So one other thing, notice that you do get a bonus of credits. At rating 3, it's not very strong. But the reason that rating 3 is important is because of this last little chunk right here. So each faction is going to give you something something that is unique to that faction. In this case, it's a module. It's going to be the Prismatic Shield Generator. So the Prismatic Shield Generator is a fantastic shield generator to have. You have to be pledged for 4 weeks, and you have to be rank 3. Now, looking, looking at uh, some of the others, like uh, let's go ahead and take a look at her sister here, a Levigny Duval. For her, if you happen to be at rank 3, you get access to the Imperial Hammer. It is a multi-shot railgun. Yeah, fairly handy. So, I mean, looking around, let's take a look at him. With this guy, you get the Pacifier Frag Cannon. Once again, 4 weeks, rating 3, large frag cannon with decreased damage but increased range and a tighter spread. So you can kind of poke around and see what it is that you might want to dive into. One thing to note is that regardless of which faction you pick, you can always back out of it. So moving along, the first phase in anything related to power play is going to be the preparation phase. The preparation phase is done by using those little preparation nominations, like I pointed out. Rating 3 gets you 50 of them. Basically, basically the players are going to go and they're going to select a system and then nominate that system for preparation. So the way that this works is basically the systems that are prepared have to end up underneath the command capital cost or control, whatever. Anyhow, underneath the unit cost that is available within that cycle. So if we actually go down here and we select the system, we can take a look at the potential value of the system versus the cost of it, etc. Now these guys that are in red, you notice their potential values are generally not necessarily all that great. So this guy represents, represents, or should represent, the best potential value for the number of CC that are spent on it. Now, assuming that this guy goes through after the end of this cycle, which uh, the cycles occur towards the middle of the week. Uh, in this case, we have approximately three days left. We'll take a look at where you can see that in just a second. Um, I've, after it goes through the preparation stage, if it's nominated for preparation, it clicks over into the expansion stage. Aisling has nothing in expansion stage currently. So let's go ahead and take a look at someone that does, and on the way by, we'll make a drive-by on the cycle timer. Right up here, upper right-hand corner. So three days till the next cycle begins. So until that next cycle begins, everything that you see here is potential could-haves or could-happens. 
So something ends up getting uh, nominated for expansion, it clicks over to the expansion tab. So, and then when you select it, you can see what exactly is going on with it. Now there is a trigger line. The trigger line determines when an action is taken. If the trigger line is not reached, it more or less sits where it's at for the time being. So one of these bars needs to make its way above the trigger line in order for something to take place. If the expansion line gets above it, then the system simply expands and it slides to the right and ends up becoming a control system. If the opposition ends up winning, basically the expansion attempt fails and goodbye system from the expansion overview. So the other thing to note is that the, uh, the totals here that are required to make the thing happen, that trigger line, are different levels. Uh, the reason for that can be the distance from the, from the capital city of the faction or the capital system of the faction. Um, it could also be the distance from anything else that the faction controls. There are any number of things. For example, if you take a look at Sothis over here, this is a perfect example of this. It's 485 light years from home base for Edmund Mahan. The trigger to actually expand into it is 96,471 units. That is a lot. The opposition there doesn't have much. Just 5,200 units will successfully oppose the whole thing. Also, you take a look at potential value, notice that it's minus 312 cc. That's really not a fantastic thing to try and go and expand into. Anyhow, once the expansion phase is done, then the planet ends up under control. Now, once it's under control, uh, you can fortify it, or the faction can fortify it, or it can be undermined. In this case, we're taking a look at a system that is almost completely successfully fortified. What fortification does is it drops the upkeep cost down to nothing. So you still have to pay the overhead, but you just don't have to pay this guy. The 37cc goes bye-bye. So we can see that in the last cycle, the upkeep was 0cc, meaning that it was, in fact, successfully fortified. On the other side of that coin, should this undermine thing end up managing to hit the high watermark here, suddenly the cost for the cost to continue owning this system jumped to 203cc, which can mean that the system falls into a state of turmoil and eventually doesn't become one at all. You can also see the base income of this system and its surrounding area of exploited planets or its dominion. So let's see here. Let's look at another one of these guys. So with this one. This one is most likely going to go bye-bye here shortly. The reason being is because the cost, he's going to be undermined unless something crazy happens between now and three days from now. Now, it's important to note that with a trigger bar being fairly low here, such as this guy is, the, uh, the fortification progress actually has to exceed the bar of the undermining progress in order for the system to be successfully fortified. If not, then the undermining wins, and then you end up with a system that is either in turmoil or it costs a whole bunch of money to maintain it. Generally, when there's a, a turmoil, there would be a lot of combat going on in the system, a lot of places that one could go and soak up some nice little bounty vouchers. Uh, the other thing to take a look at here is going to be the stats, and this gives you a whole bunch of information on what goes on it within uh, within the control systems, uh, whether or not they're maintained or owned by the Empire, excuse me, loyal to the Empire, the Federation, Independent, or Alliance, and each faction is going to have some different details for these guys. You can also take a look on the left-hand side of the panel there. The control details, uh, the Dominion details, so basic control systems versus the exploited systems, etc. Basically, each control system has a sphere of influence around it. Any systems inside that sphere of influence become exploited systems. Fairly straightforward. So, that pretty much concludes this high-level overview at PowerPlay. And what I plan to do in the making of this video is I will end up allying myself or pledging towards someone Probably Miss Lavigny Duval here, and the reason that I've picked her is, first off, because at rating 3 I get the Imperial Hammer, which could be fun, multi-shot railgun. That's a good thing. Uh, the other nice thing is that should I happen to make it to rating number 5, I get a 100% increase on bounty payouts and controlled or exploited systems, which could be a long-term goal. I don't really spend as much time as I'd like to because, you know, I also have a life. Um, one other thing, or probably the thing that has made her fairly popular is the fact that in any system she has uh, she has exploited controlled etc you're going to get a 20 percent increase in bounty claims regardless of who exactly that system is affiliated with so that's pretty handy for the pocketbook uh, the other one i'm taking a look at is going to be miss aisling duval over here uh, the reason being is just because prismatic shields are awesome um, the other the other nice thing that goes on with her is that you can make a bunch of money uh, importing imperial slaves 
So within any system she controls, regardless of who owns it, she bans slaves, driving the price on them up. Um, obviously, it's a little bit of smuggling. I'm not really concerned with all that. But anyhow, this is, uh, this is just one in a series of videos. In the next video, we're going to pledge ourselves to a faction, and we're going to start going out there and actually getting ourselves some merits. So if I've missed anything in this overview, or you'd like to see anything else in the upcoming videos, or maybe there's something specific that's just been a question that you haven't been able to find an answer to, please let me know down in the comments section. If you enjoyed the video, give me a thumbs up. And uh, if you'd like to hang out for the rest of the series, please feel free to whack the subscribe button. Once again, I've been Jack Alatesh. Thanks for watching and fly safe.